In this video, we're going to investigate the mathematics of an epidemic that is spreading around the world. How can researchers around the world come up with mathematical models that predict things such as what is the rate of a spread of the epidemic, how bad is the epidemic going to be, and so forth. In this video, we're going to study a simple epidemic model called the SIR model. The idea works as follows. I'm going to imagine taking all the people in the world and dividing them into three different categories. The first category is called susceptibles. Susceptibles are all of the people that are capable of becoming sick from an infection. And in this case, we'll assume we have some sort of infection that is capable of infecting everybody. So at the beginning, everybody is going to be susceptible. Then we have a second category of people. Those are the people who are infected. And when you become infected, you leave the susceptible category. For most diseases, after you've gotten it, after you've been infected, you're not now susceptible to get it a second time. You just get infected once. And then those who have the infected disease, they are going to transition at some point, hopefully, into a recovered status. And as long as I assume that the death rate is small compared to the number that are being recovered, I'll just imagine that this explains everybody. Everybody is either susceptible, which means they could get ill, or they're currently infected, in which case they could go and infect other people, or they could go and become recovered, in which case they can neither get this particular illness, nor can they give it to somebody else. Those are the assumptions of this model. I can write this assumption as an equation by saying that the sum of the susceptibles, the infected, and the recovered people adds up to n, which is everybody. Perhaps not everybody in the world, we may want to zoom in just on, say, one little town and we could have n be everybody in a town. One of the things that's going to be helpful for us is to give some labels to what happened to these values at time t equal to zero, at the very beginning, so-called initial conditions. And the idea here is that at the beginning, there is, well, no recovered people because we're at the beginning. There's going to be a very small number of infected people, probably just one right at the very beginning, although we might not start tracking data for a little while. And so the I naught, the initial amount of infected people, might just be some relatively small number. And then the S naught, the amount of susceptible people at time equal to zero, is everybody else. So a very large number. So I sort of describe pictorially what's going on, that we have this sort of cascade of people who are susceptible and then they become infected and then the infected people create more infected, but some of those infected people then go on to become recovered. However, what I really want to do is try to write down equations that govern the behavior of this S of t, I of t, and R of t. What I'm going to do here is use a type of mathematics called a system of differential equations. Well, let me explain what that is. The idea is that for each of these three things, I want to write down a rate of change with respect to t. This is what a derivative is. So this ds dt you can think of as how the number of susceptibles is changing in time. di dt is our sort of calculus shorthand for how the number of infected people is changing with respect to time. And likewise for dr dt, the number of recovered people, how that is changing with respect to time. So I want to have an equation for each of these. And if I think first about just ds dt, the change in the susceptibles, I'm trying to think, well, what does that depend on? The way that, say, I was infected and you were susceptible, the way that I might infect you would be that if you and I both came in contact, then there's some probability that I would infect you. So when I think about what this should depend on, the more there's connections between people, the more the S and the I's are going to multiply together to create more interactions, the higher the likelihood that susceptible people are going to become infected. So as an equation, I can take that premise and, and write it down like this. I'm going to say that the rate of change of susceptibles is a negative because the susceptibles are getting smaller as time goes on as they transition to being infected. It's a negative. Some constant a, which I think of as a positive constant here, the sort of proportionality constant, and then multiplied by s and i together because the larger that multiplication is, the larger the number of interactions between susceptible and infected people are. Okay, so that's my ds dt. What about my di dt? Well, 
First of all, when I think about infected people, one way you can get infected people is that susceptible people transition to infected. So if you lost minus ASI out of the susceptibles, then you're going to gain it here in the infected as well. You get a plus ASI. However, that's not the only factor that affects infected people. There's new infected people coming in when you transition from susceptible to infected, but there are also losses of infected people when they get recovered from the disease, when their immune system sort of kicks in and they fight it off, and then they're no longer capable of infecting anybody. And so when that happens, you also have a loss of infected people, which is a good thing, and therefore a negative BI term. The more infected there are, the bigger the rate of change of infected is leaving, the, the bigger this sort of BI is going to become. And then for the recovered people, if you are losing BI from the infected, you gain them right back into the recovered, so you get DRDT is equal to B times I. This is a system of differential equations. And much like a system of equations in general, the idea is that all three of these must be true at the same time. If you have a guess for your S of T, I of T, and R of T, it must obey all three of these equations if it's going to satisfy the model that we're developing. Now, in this video, we're not going to completely try and solve this particular system of so-called non-linear differential equations. The S times I creates non-linearity. That turns out to be challenging. But we can still get a lot of nice qualitative features about how epidemics spread from analyzing this system of differential equations. Let me show you some graphs of what the S of T, the I of T, and the R of T may possibly look like. The equations that I have don't give you the S of T, the R of T, and the I of T directly. They give you their rates of change, equations that govern their behavior. But if I think about the DSDT, as I say, initially everybody is sort of susceptible. So if I imagine I've got some town, it's got 500 people, and I'm going to imagine the course of some epidemic that lasts, say, 60 days. So if I look down the yellow, what's happening here is that it starts at approximately 500, and then it drops as time goes on, the number of susceptibles goes less and less and less and less and less, and I'm going to imagine an infection that actually sweeps through this particular town, and it's going to infect everybody. At the end of the day, the number of susceptible people go to zero because everybody's had this particular infection. And so at the end of the day, the number of susceptibles goes to zero because at some point, everybody in the town has been infected. Likewise, for the recovered people, if everyone has gotten infected and then gone through that process of becoming recovered, their immune system's kicked in, then the number of recovered people, which initially was zero, in the blue you can see goes up, 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 and gets close to the 500. Okay, but now let's look at DIDT, which is sort of the interesting one. Because if you look at the equation that governs DIDT, that's got two different terms, a positive and a negative, and for the first portion, when the number of susceptibles is large, that positive term that includes the number of susceptibles dominates. And so the infected goes up, 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 up. But as time goes on and the number of susceptibles is going to drop, then the negative term starts to dominate the positive term. And then the infected people go down in quantity as they transition to being recovered more quickly then they get new cases from people transitioning out of being susceptible. So these three graphs give one example of the kind of behaviors that you can get when you try to solve this particular system of differential equations. Let me zoom in a little bit more on that interesting equation, the DIDT equal to the ASI, the number of new infected, minus the BI, the loss of infected people to recover people. If I think about whether there's going to be an epidemic or whether there's not going to be an epidemic, I want to look right at the beginning, right before the number of infected people has skyrocketed. So if I look at that exact same equation, but I plug in t equal to zero, then where I had s, I will write s naught for the initial number of susceptibles. And for i, I'll write i naught, the initial number of infected. So the big question here is whether this rate of change is less than zero or bigger than zero. If it's bigger than zero, then di dt, the rate of change of infected respect to t, is increasing, and the number of infected people is going to go up. I'm going to have an epidemic. If, however, di dt is less than zero, 
then yes, new people may get infected, but they leave the status of being infected faster than new people are gained. And so it's going to die out and you're not going to have an epidemic. That's what we're hoping to have. Okay, so if I look at this, I see that my equation has an I naught in both terms, so I'm going to cancel my I naughts, and that just says I'm asking, is AS naught minus B going to be less than zero? And if I go and put my B to the other side and then divide it out, this is the same thing as asking, is AS naught divided B less than one? So this is the question. When you look at these coefficients, the initial and number of susceptible people, which is probably everybody in your region you're considering, the A and the B, these two different transmission rates, this particular ratio is what we're asking, is it less than one or bigger than one? If I focus on it a little bit more, it's actually given a name that you may have seen before. It is called R0. R0, by the way, is not to be confused with as the initial population of recovered people, a, a similar sounding term, I look for that, but R0 is defined to be this particular ratio. So, so what does that mean? Well, one of the things that we can do is try to manipulate that ratio. Indeed, you probably have heard that one of the things that you can do to prevent a lot of spreads is to wash your hands. So if you lower the transmission rate, if you lower that value of A where they go from susceptible to infected, what you are doing is that value, that, that constant is going down. And so a lot of the public health policies that people do, for example, quarantining infected people, which sort of takes them out of the population and prevents their ability to spread, or just washing your hands, which is going to lower that transmission rate, that's getting the A down and increasing the probability that this ratio is less than one. Another thing you could try to do is affect the S naught, and it depends on what you're talking about. If there is a vaccine, you can lower the number of susceptible people by giving them vaccines, and that's going to bring this S naught way down. So, for example, if you can say half of the people are going to have the vaccine, then you're going to lower your R naught by a factor of two. The B is a little bit harder to change. It says if you have people who are infected, then what is the way to get them to becoming recovered? Well, for most cases, what you're just trying to do here is just keep people alive and they're going to recover, their immune system is going to go off themselves. So you can't really affect B too much. Okay, so th this is what happens at time t equal to zero, but I want to sort of look at what happens around time t equal to zero. As in, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the same equation here, this di dt. I'm going to now imagine that the infected number can increase, but I'm just going to assume that the s is approximately constant. And so this is only going to be true around the time t equal to zero. I want to look just near the beginning. So in other words, this is equal to i times some constant, this constant a s naught minus b. Well, this is a differential equation. It relates the derivative of i to i itself. And a candidate to be a solution to this differential equation is i of t is just the exponential of a s naught minus b times t. Indeed, if, if you took the derivative of that, the constant would come out the front. And that would look just like i again times this constant. If you plug that in, indeed you get a solution to that ODE. So what we're saying is that near the beginning, when these assumptions are valid, so near t equal to zero, where we will assume our initial susceptibles S0 is approximately constant, then you get exponential growth. So here we are on March 10th. If we look at the epidemic that is facing our world right now, we can actually go and look at what the curves look like. For example, this is the growth outside of China. And what you see is that we have exponential growth. This data, by the way, comes from Worldometers, which is a wonderful website, and I will link it down in the description. So this kind of exponential shape that we're here well models the behavior from the SIR model in small values of t, where t is not yet so large. As time goes on, even in the worst and most horrible cases that we would like to avoid, as the number of infected people skyrockets and the number of susceptible people goes down, eventually this will flatten out and decline, as we saw in the earlier examples for a little region with just 500 people. But we're certainly not there yet, and we're trying to do everything from sort of a public health perspective to contain it so that we don't have to rely on that feature to bring the number of infected people down. This exponential graph is sometimes nicer to be viewed logarithmically. So 
Now we're plotting the number of cases on a logarithmic scale. When you take a logarithm of an exponential, you just get a linear, and indeed this looks relatively linear. So the point is that this model is currently doing a reasonable job of predicting the actual real-world data. Of course, this is a very simplistic model, and if you're actually trying to work and try to model this accurately to make prediction, you want to include many other factors that we have not included here. But nevertheless, this sort of traditional model gives a good stepping stone into the field of epidemic modeling. Finally, if you enjoyed this video, give it a like. If you have questions or thoughts about the mathematics, leave a comment down below and we will do some more math in the next video.